Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, episode 2.20, The First Decade of Pennsylvania. Over the last two episodes, we have explored the early life of William Penn as we examined his desire to begin a new colony. We looked at his religious beliefs and how those helped act as a motivation for him to start a new colony in America. Last time, we spent our half hour talking about the Pennsylvania frame of government. We looked at the provisions of the document and explored some of the political realities that Penn faced when trying to get his colony set up. Now, originally, I had planned on wrapping up our introduction to Pennsylvania series in two episodes. However, as so often ends up being the case, there was simply too many things that I wanted to talk about, and we just ran out of time. That means that this episode is my chance to double back, cover some of the topics that I have not been able to get through thus far, and put a nice bow on getting Pennsylvania founded. More specifically, this week we are going to look at how the frame of government worked in reality. What were its shortcomings and where did it succeed? We are going to also look at some of the issues that Penn personally was dealing with inside the colony. Virtually everywhere that William Penn looked, he found another border dispute that was going to have to be addressed. Penn is going to spend much of that first decade after the founding of Pennsylvania fighting to protect his borders from the other colonies, who argued previous claims to his now vast holdings. So with that, let's dive right on in. Last time, we had spent the entire episode looking at the frame of government and how William Penn nearly immediately ran into problems with having his vision fully realized. As we had discussed two weeks ago, the Pennsylvania colony saw a rapid population growth quickly after its founding. This is largely due to a couple of reasons. First, the colony was advantageously located right in the middle of the Chesapeake colonies such as Maryland and Virginia to the south, and the New England colonies to the north. This helps ensure that the overland passage between the colonies would have to flow right through Penn's holdings. This meant that for Penn, his colony would be able to serve as a middleman for intercolonial trade. Its location also meant that Pennsylvania was going to be a popular spot for smuggling goods. Those goods that were enumerated in the Navigation Acts that we talked about when we discussed Bacon's Rebellion had to pass through somewhere. And legal or not, the Pennsylvania colony was going to act as a natural bridge between the southern and the northern colonies for those smuggled goods. Further fueling population growth is going to be the droves of Quakers that came over to Pennsylvania. The state of Quakers inside of the English sphere had changed a lot over the preceding decades. During the 1650s, when George Fox had founded the group, they had become a serious threat to Puritan rule that had taken hold in England during the Cromwell Protectorate. Then, following the Restoration, what emerged in England was more of a run-of-the-mill religious persecution, like what the Puritans had endured under the early days of William Laud. This included things such as the leading members finding themselves locked up in the Tower of London. The Quakers differ from the Puritans in the aspect that they do not have official preachers but rather anybody can lead a service at any time, so long as they felt the divine inspiration to lead the service. This means that unlike in the Puritan circles, there was no single person leading the show. There was not the same level of dissenting ministers. Despite the apparent lack of any kind of structural hierarchy, however, there were still certainly outspoken members of the Society of Friends, men like William Penn. Persecution of the Quakers began to ebb throughout the 1670s. The group held many of the same tenets that the Puritans did and placed an emphasis on hard work and thriftiness. This means that many of the Quakers ended up becoming fairly wealthy. With rising wealth, many Quakers sought to move past what had previously been seen as a level of noble persecution. They wanted a degree of acceptance within the English system. And while they were plenty aware that they were not about to rise to the top of English society, they did want recognition of their rights to continue practicing their religion as they saw fit. A big part of this wealth is that even though people found their religious beliefs to be strange, the Quakers were absolutely scrupulous about how they conducted their business. If you wanted to deal with somebody safely and not worry about getting ripped off, then a Quaker was a pretty good way to go. This preferred spot amongst businessmen meant that even more income and wealth began to flow into Quaker merchants. What this practically means for William Penn is that the main group he is looking to bring over are largely middle class. As was the case in New England, this is going to have a moderating effect on the super wealthy coming over. 
but is also going to prevent an issue with urban poor making the trip. While some did come over as indentured servants, the numbers remain relatively small. Therefore, the people who were coming over tended to be middle-class Quakers. Many of them likely viewed Penn's colony to be a place where not only would they be immune from persecution, but they would be able to sit in a position of power. Penn did genuinely preach religious tolerance, and he does earnestly seem to want Pennsylvania to be tolerant of all different types of Christianity. However, at the end of the day, it was the Quakers who were going to end up making up the majority of the population, and therefore in theory at least would make up a majority of the council and the assembly. Tolerance is great and all, but they were undoubtedly happy to be in a position where they were going to have a serious influence over the functioning of the government. The Quakers likewise did not come fragmented as we have seen in the other colonies. Rather, they came as intact family units. Having a mixture of both men and women in the colony ensured that the colony would see continual growth moving forward, even if the rate of immigration subsided. Beyond the obvious aspects of allowing for the natural growth of the colony, it also helped make Pennsylvania quickly a more popular destination than other colonies had been at their founding. Nobody was excited at the prospect of leaving their families. Being able to bring them along made it an easier task for Pennsylvania to attract new settlers from the outset than, say, over in Virginia, for example. Now, if you think that this isn't sounding any different from, say, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, well, you're not wrong. The Bay Colony also went through a period of explosive growth as a result of the Great Puritan Migration. However, Massachusetts, for all of its success, did suffer from the limiting factor that came from a colony that was so locked to their religion. Recall that power in 1630s Massachusetts flowed directly through the Puritan Church. If you weren't an admitted member of the Puritan Church, you certainly weren't going to be entrusted with the ability to hold public office, nor even a vote. Here, however, Pennsylvania stands in contrast to Massachusetts in that William Penn was particularly tolerant. By maintaining tolerance and having no state-sponsored or supported church, it meant that Pennsylvania would grow with far fewer restrictions than its New England neighbors could initially. While Quakers are going to make up a significant amount of the colony, Penn made clear that his colony was open to everybody who wanted to come. Of course, as with everything else, there is a catch. In the past, colonies, in order to attempt to quickly grow their populations, would have rules in place that if you could pay for your own passage, you would benefit from a lucrative headright system. Often, paying one's own passage alone would be enough to get a colonist a significant plot of land for free. And generally, with the more people that they brought over, the larger the overall plot would become. The companies that ran these early colonies did not view the land itself as being a resource but rather viewed those things that could be exported as being the real value to the new world. William Penn, on the other hand, relied upon the value of the land itself. There was to be no headright system or handouts of land. Rather, if you wanted land, you were going to need to buy it. The most immediate effect of this is that Pennsylvania was going to become a haven for land speculators. Sure enough, we know that in the first several years of Pennsylvania, over 750,000 acres were sold to some 600 investors. For Penn, well, great that the land was selling, he needed to bring people over to help support the Pennsylvania economy. The first group of people to come to the colony was by no means paltry. In 1682, 23 ships carrying over 2,000 colonists arrived in Pennsylvania. The following year, another group of 2,000 arrived. As we discussed a moment ago, the Quakers had increasingly during the previous decade become seen as being particularly honest businessmen. Religious tolerance aside, a majority of those coming to Pennsylvania during those first years were in fact Penn's fellow Quakers. With many of them coming over with their full families, they tended to have sold off holdings back in England, meaning that they came with more resources available to spend in Pennsylvania. Combine that with the fact that the land wasn't free, it meant that anybody coming over was either going to need to be prepared to lease land from a landlord or was going to need to buy a plot from themselves. What this means is that the population of Pennsylvania largely was made up of an artisan class. Unlike in Virginia, where huge landowners controlled the colony, Pennsylvania, though it did contain some large estate holders, 
largely saw neither the excessive wealth of the Chesapeake colonies nor the vast plantation-style estates. When you throw in the advantageous position of Pennsylvania, right in between the Chesapeake colonies and the New England colonies, and along the Delaware River, it meant that Pennsylvania would be able to easily trade with their neighbors. This combination of factors meant that for land speculators and potential colonists, Pennsylvania was filled with economic potential, something that is very useful when trying to tempt people to head across the Atlantic. When Pennsylvania was founded, it came into a North America that had just spent the previous half-decade embroiled in wars with the Indians, with Bacon's Rebellion in the South and King Philip's War to the North. And while there is a conversation that we can have about those wars being more about the greater relationship between the colonies and the English crown itself, they were both undeniably conflicts that revolved around questions of colonial relations with native tribes. Pennsylvania was being founded at a time when the Indians who traditionally lived in the area were exceptionally weak. European diseases ran rampant throughout the native populations, and epidemics were both frequent and devastating. Indiscriminate attacks by English colonists during Bacon's Rebellion had further damaged an already weakened population. With the native tribes already in such a weak state, the traditional enemies of those local tribes, namely the Five Nations of the Iroquois, took advantage of this weakness and launched their own attacks, adding additional misery to an already desperate situation. For Pennsylvania, this means that those coming into the colony were facing a group that was already weakened from disease and warfare. These natives were struggling to survive, rather than being tribes that would present an existential threat to the colony. What was left in the region was the Delaware tribe, also known as the Lenny Lenape. Though surviving better than the other native tribes of the region, the Lenape tribe was still in a bad place. Their closest allies, the Susquehannock, had been forced to relocate following their defeat in Bacon's Rebellion. Penn smartly acted with fairness towards the tribe and acknowledged their lands rather than attempting to openly encroach. Beyond basic fairness, however, this move proved to be an intelligent one. By settling the Lenape tribe off to the west, Penn had essentially set up a safety perimeter around the colony. Should any invasion come from the other tribes or the French to the west of the main part of the settlement, it was the Lenape that would suffer the first blow, hopefully allowing Penn the time he needed to mount a defense. In other words, it was the Lenape tribe that was in a position where, if a surprise attack did come, they would be the ones surprised and not the English. For smaller scale skirmishes, the hope was that the Lenape would be able to fend for themselves and help keep the English from having to fight at all something that must have sounded pretty good to the pacifist Quakers. So how did this new Pennsylvania colony come to function in reality? To explain how the frame of government did in practice, we are going to first have to turn to the question of land disputes throughout the new colony. If you are thinking that was a pretty awful segue, you are not wrong, but just go with me here and it will all make sense in just a few moments. One of the defining features of the new Pennsylvania colony is the sheer size of it. This is a massive amount of land that is going to be bordering a lot of other colonies. Pennsylvania shared significant amount of borderland with New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Connecticut, and Maryland. As we have seen to this point, we really need to avoid thinking of the North American colonies as being anything even resembling united at this point, except for a bit of mutual cooperation up in New England. Even there, however, it really was just enough cooperation to get by in the face of common enemies. For the most part, however, the colonies, while not outright enemies, viewed each other as competitors. The colonies were primarily in place for their proprietors to make boatloads of money. A large colony being stuck in the middle of everything isn't going to be something that the then existing colonies viewed with anything other than distrust and scorn. After all, a new colony has popped up with the main goal of taking away trade from the other colonies. The manifestation of this is going to come to the forefront in the area of land disputes. Today, we are used to the idea of nice, well-defined borders. In the United States, we know where the state boundaries are, as they have been stagnant for a long time now. However, in the early colonial era, things are far less certain. Claims on land were often vague and left a lot of open questions about the actual scope of a proprietor's claim. For William Penn, a man whose property bordered so many colonies, he quickly found himself embroiled in multiple border disputes. 
Well, Penn would deal with numerous border disputes. The one that I'm going to focus on is his dispute with Lord Baltimore in the Maryland colony. This dispute is going to be, by a wide margin, his most problematic of all these border fights. Looking at a map, it is instantly clear why this dispute between Penn and Baltimore would be such a pressing issue. With Penn controlling the lower counties, the future state of Delaware, Penn posed an immediate risk to Baltimore's holdings. Before Penn had even reached America, Baltimore had begun his legal wrangling to protect his eastern border from the incursion of Penn. The lower counties were a critical portion of Penn's holdings, as they provided the necessary access that Penn needed to the Atlantic. In the highly competitive world of 17th century colonial America, ocean access was critical for shipping. Without ocean access, Penn would have likely found himself needing to pay custom dues to other colonial governors, on top of the customary taxes on shipping that went back to England. Lord Baltimore, for his part, did not want to see incursion onto his holdings, and further would have been plenty happy restricting the trade of the new colony. As discussed earlier, colonial cooperation remained relatively muted, especially in the area of international trade. Penn had initially hoped that the dispute between him and Baltimore would blow over. However, by the time that 1683 rolled around, it was clear that neither side was willing to back down from their claims. Part of the problem is that practically, surveying in the 1680s was a difficult and inexact science. Borders were crudely drawn, which made disputes over borders a common occurrence. However, the dispute between Baltimore and Penn had become increasingly bitter, with few signs of improvement. During 1683, both Baltimore and Penn would meet twice to try to bridge the gaps. Unfortunately for everybody, the meetings were largely unproductive, as the real threat of litigation back in London became increasingly likely. Following the failure of the springtime meeting, Baltimore penned a letter laying out his complaints against Penn to the Committee of Trade back in England. Penn responded by getting depositions from those living in the lower counties about the terrible treatment and abuses of power over the years by Baltimore. Baltimore encouraged the settlers in the lower counties to outright reject the authority of Penn, a dangerous proposition for Baltimore, considering that the entire Chesapeake region had exploded in rebellions less than a decade earlier. Let's not forget that Maryland, Baltimore's own colony, wasn't exempt from these rebellions, though they would never reach the level of what we had seen down in Virginia. With Baltimore calling for his rejection of Penn's authority, and several colonists taking him up on that request, the situation in the lower counties had become downright hostile, and open fighting was not totally out of the question. Baltimore ordered his cousin to erect a fort near Newcastle, in preparation for potential hostilities, should things continue to go south. Both parties did continue to attempt to work through this, with Governor Donegan of New York acting as a mediator. However, by this point, the main objective of basically everybody else in the colonies was trying to keep Pennsylvania and Maryland from launching into a violent confrontation with each other. In May of 1684, after more than a year of worsening relations, Baltimore made the decision to depart North America and head back to England to appear in person before the Committee of Trade. Penn, immediately realizing that he could not allow Baltimore to make a personal appearance without them getting to hear from him as well, made plans and quickly departed from the colony to return to England himself, for the upcoming battle over the borders. Now, by this point, you may well be asking yourself what any of this has to do with the actual functioning of the frame of government. The answer is that the dealings with Baltimore was going to necessitate that Penn, unquestionably the most powerful man in the colony, had to head back to England. Before he left, however, Penn began having an increasing number of problems with rivals within the colony. Inside of Pennsylvania, the process of surveying lots took time, and impatient settlers were tired of waiting. These long waits had meant that the colony's assumed prosperity was less than expected, and Penn suddenly found himself struggling to collect payments from the settlers for their land purchases. Rivals accused Penn of not living up to his agreement with them, while they built a city for him. The accusation was that by being slow to survey the land, it left those early settlers with long wait times before they could begin trying to establish themselves, not something that they had been told would be an issue when they had decided to come over from England. The fact remained, however, that Penn was an extremely powerful figure inside of Pennsylvania, and despite some grumbling by the colonists, while he was around, 
he was the guy who was running the show. Religious tensions also continued to exist within the colony. While Pennsylvania itself was made up largely of Quakers, the lower counties were far more religiously diverse. Despite the fact that Penn was religiously tolerant and that he had shown no outward signs that he was planning to make this into an exclusively Quaker colony, tensions always simmered between the two groups. These underlying tensions kept constant stress on the young colony, and religious differences often meant political strife. With Penn leaving the colony on August 18th, 1684, to return to England, the stabilizing figure that had held everything in check was suddenly gone. Penn was so critical at keeping a broad harmony inside the colony that his absence is going to create an unmistakable void. Rivals inside of Pennsylvania wasted absolutely no time stepping into this vacuum in an attempt to increase their own power and influence in the absence of William Penn. For Penn, when he left the colony in the summer of 1684, he probably would not have guessed that he would remain in England until 1699. We know that in the first full report that Penn got after leaving, he had received news of an increase in lawlessness and crime throughout the colony. More importantly, however, the assembly appears to have begun to make moves to increase their own power. Rather than simply approving the laws, the assembly wanted the power to legislate. Unsurprisingly, this was opposed by Penn. However, the fact that he was now an ocean away from the action did not exactly improve his position in the argument. Meanwhile, disputes internally over land continued to fester for Penn. As we have previously discussed, Penn had planned to aggressively sell large segments of land. However, he had been far slower in the actual distribution. These continuing delays had long since gone from being an annoyance to creating real feelings of animosity and outright hostility towards Penn. With Penn back in England, his power for the moment was diminished within the colony itself. This means that at a moment where there is now growing discontent amongst Penn's rivals, William Penn is not there to help maintain his own position. With his outright political power in the colony being continually challenged, Penn would receive a much-needed victory in the fall of 1685. After having his case heard by the Trade Commission, Penn emerged victorious. Baltimore had relied on the argument that he had the rest of the lower counties, on the basis that he had settled the land before anybody else had landed in the region. Penn, however, was able to show that the Dutch had been present in the lower counties prior to Baltimore's claim. As Baltimore's claim only extended to the uninhabited lands, and those inhabited by the Indians, the ruling was that he never possessed the lands in the lower counties at all. Penn therefore emerged as the clear victor and was now solely in control of the lower counties, much to the disappointment of Lord Baltimore. Instead of getting on a ship back home, however, William Penn found himself thrust into a political environment that would ensure that he would not be returning to the colony for over a decade. The first order of business for Penn, now that his dispute with Baltimore was settled, was to spend his time in England working to drum up business for the colony. However, while he threw himself into recruiting efforts, Penn found that his colony was coming under continual fire. Reports coming back from Pennsylvania described a colony with increasing crime and unrest. To the English Quakers, the prime audience for Penn to be recruiting from, there was a sense of shock and disappointment. What Penn had once declared to be a holy experiment seemed rife with issues. Most problematically for Penn, the colony practically ceased to provide him with any money at all. In a double blow for Penn, the issue wasn't that Pennsylvania was not producing money, rather that people were simply refusing to pay their rents to the deputy governor. This would have been a blow to the political standing of Penn and a challenge to his authority. The colonists refusing to pay what they owed showed a decided lack of respect for the authority of Penn's appointees and government. However, for Penn, who really had thrown all of his eggs into a single basket, it was a devastating financial blow. Penn had initially agreed to take payments of rent in amounts of produce rather than in money specifically. This was not an entirely uncommon practice, as during those early years one would assume that there would be a slow economy. The thought here was that Penn would collect the goods and resell them himself. This, while great for the people in the colony, added an additional layer of work for Penn and meant that the added expense associated with selling the produce was going to be borne by him. However, now several years into the colony, 
Penn was past the point of collecting rents and produce and was ready to start making actual money. The problem is that the colonists had little intention of changing their method of payment, and the colonial government proved ineffective at collecting it. It is worth mentioning that Penn is going to struggle financially for the remainder of his life. He would spend time in a debtor's prison in the 1700s, and at the time of his death, was completely broke. This is something we'll talk a little bit more about down the road. What can we make out of the first decade of Pennsylvania? In so many ways, it is a mixed bag for the young colony. Pennsylvania was positioned in a place where it had the ability to thrive. An advantageous position in the colony meant that the colony was going to be in the prime place to grow both in terms of population and economically. And sure enough, this is what we see throughout the first decade and into the future. Pennsylvania, and chiefly Philadelphia, would grow to become an epicenter of action in the 18th century, a position that it will maintain as we head into the political environments of the American Revolution. However, practically speaking, the high-minded frame of government would prove to be a difficult document to enforce. With William Penn inside of the colony, he was in an unquestioned position of power. However, as soon as he left back to England, the frame of government appears to have become more of a suggestion than an actual functioning government document. There are going to be amendments made moving forward that are going to attempt to help increase the effectiveness of the frame of government. However, those are not going to appear until we get towards the early 18th century, a topic that we will cover when we get there. Penn's position in the colony during the 1680s would become less and less the longer he remained in London. In fact, one of the primary complaints that Penn made of the colony and their Quaker inhabitants is that by the latter part of the decade, he was hardly receiving any news at all. Theoretically, Penn had the power to make laws for the colony. However, despite this, nobody was interested in telling the guy what was going on. This situation causes William Penn to move in a direction where he found himself barking out orders more than he was having any actual debate on the subject. Penn had become so disenchanted with the colony by the end of the decade that there were some reports that he flirted with the idea of selling the colony back to the crown. Internally on the ground in Pennsylvania, despite a growing economy, accusations of favoritism towards the Quakers remained. This proved to be especially despised down in the decidedly non-Quaker lower counties, which Penn had fought so hard to retain. For a colony that had prided itself on religious toleration, these allegations of favoritism undermined the entire end. Penn would, to regain control of the colony and avoid dreaded royal intervention, send David Lloyd to the colony as the attorney general in order to attempt to solidify the laws and bring a degree of cooperation to the colonists. What Penn did not know was that Lloyd would end up becoming one of his chief rivals for the remainder of Penn's life. The story of the first decade in Pennsylvania, therefore, is both one of success and failure. The colony did see population and economic growth, though in so many ways failed to achieve those high-minded ambitions that Penn had initially had. For Penn personally, Pennsylvania was the plan to save his family fortune. However, we know that Penn would end up spending time in a debtor's prison later in life and would die with absolutely nothing to his name, so that should tell you how well that plan went. In that regard, personally for Penn, Pennsylvania as an investment never really panned out. We are going to return to Pennsylvania early next season as we watch the colony continue to struggle under these issues. There will be no quick and easy solution for Pennsylvania and for William Penn, he is going to spend much of his life fighting to maintain his influence over the colony. The theme of opposition to the Penn family is going to be an ever-present story in the colonies up until the American Revolution, when the Penns will finally be forced out of power. We will discuss it more in the future, but for much of the middle part of the 18th century, leading up to the Revolution, Benjamin Franklin would prove to be the party leading the opposition to what he saw as the arbitrary rule of the Penn family. For now, however, it is time that the show moves back up to New England. Next time, we are going to look at the aftermath of King Philip's War and what had become a cause of deep concern back in England. This is going to lead to a series of events that is going to see the crown clamp down on the independence of the New England colonies in order to fully assert the king's control over the region. This will in turn lead to political upheavals in New England 
that is going to have long-term repercussions as we march towards the glorious revolution in America. As always, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks, that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And with that, I will see you all back here in two weeks' time, and we will begin watching The Crown deal with a recalcitrant New England. <laughs>